I'm Tom Lusher, editor-in-chief of the European Heart Journal, and this is EHJ Today, and uh, we're talking in Davos at the Cardiology Update with Professor Adam Torbicki from Warsaw, Poland. Adam, welcome. Thanks. You're an expert in pulmonary embolism, and we would like to discuss for our listeners a bit uh, and viewers uh, what are the new things uh, that we have to uh, build into our practice in terms of trigger mechanisms for uh, pulmonary embolism, diagnosis, and, and management? The, there is quite a long list of new things in these guidelines. It has been six years since the previous edition has been published. Uh, so we have probably time just to highlight a few of them, which are the most important ones. I think that diagnostic algorithms are pretty stable. They haven't changed much, except for the fact that now we can I exclude pulmonary embolism based on the dimers which are adjusted to age. This is very important because elderly people have uh, elevated the dimer levels mm -hmm. and so far this very simple and very efficient method of uh, making your decision not to treat the patient despite the clinical suspicion of PE couldn't be used in, in this uh, group. Now it is possible because you just calculate uh, cut off the dimer level based on age if you are above 50. So this would be something uh, important for clinical practice. So until 50 it's rather stable and then it starts to increase? Yeah. So if you are 70 then your cutoff level would be 700 and not 500 as it as used to be because it was mm -hmm. fixed first. Okay. Then uh, a very important thing for initial risk stratification which of course is linked to therapeutic decisions because you make two most important decisions based uh, strictly on clinical grounds. So if the patient is in shock or in hypotension, then you follow the special diagnostic path, special algorithm, but also you treat with, we call it primary reperfusion, which will be mostly thrombolysis, but also surgery or interventional cardiology. What is uh, the cutoff value for hypotension? Uh, hypotension it is 90. If it is below 90 or there is a drop from the normal values of more than 40, this is more difficult in clinical yes. practice. But anyway, this is the limit that, that has been uh, in place for some, uh, some, some years and it seems to be working. Then you consider the patient high risk and then you go very quickly with diagnosis, usually starting with uh, bedside echocardiography to mm -hmm. see whether there is right ventricular overload. If you can, if you, if you, can, you, you do also a CT angio and then you make your decision. So you compare this, uh, the, the diameter of the right and the left ventricle yeah. to see whether the, quo uh, the ratio has changed. Eh? Whether the right heart uh, dominates or yeah. the left heart, this is the most important issue. But of course an experienced echocardiographer will, will have much more to say here. But bedside, I, I would like to stress, not waiting for this echo to, right. you know, even half an hour, then you are losing the patient. Yes, it's, a, it's an emergency if you think he's unstable, yes. Like a, a, like a STEMI, essentially. So you, you have been pretty, pretty quick. Also because if you are in shock, and it is not pulmonary embolism anyway, you have to make your diagnosis sure. very quickly. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, and on the other side, you can calculate so-called PESI score, and if it is very low, uh, and this is purely clinical score, which looks not only at the current status of the patient, but also com comorbidities, Such whether as? there is a cancer, uh, whether there was chronic uh, uh, respiratory or, or no, heart failure, then you add those points. But if you don't find anything, and the patient has no tachycardia, has normal blood pressure, you can early discharge such a patient home on new oral anticoagulants. This is the best uh, combination that you can have. Because you have a very quickly uh, anticoagulation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, if the SPECI score is elevated even slightly, then you can uh, use our cardiac biomarkers, troponin and BNP, uh, to judge whether the patient is at higher or lower risk within an intermediate category. So troponin shows that there is really a stress to the right ventricle. Yeah, the right ventricle is suffering and it may suffer because if the blood pressure in the aorta because of lower cardiac output is slightly lower, 
and right ventricle needs a lot of blood and oxygen, then there might not be a normal ischemia like you have with coronary artery disease, but the global ischemia, which puts this right ventricle at, at stress uh, and the function is worse. So it's a... Uh, it sort of compresses the microcirculation and uh, gives a global ischemia to the right ventricle. So uh, if you have troponin and you have signs of right ventricular overload on echo, then you consider the patient at higher intermediate risk. You would rather keep him in the hospital then? Uh, you should keep in the hospital all patients that y you haven't found PESI score low enough to discharge them. Right. Then you have to admit all those patients. But those that have both troponin or BNP and signs of right ventricular overload. It cannot be uh, necessarily echo. If you see it on CT scan that the right heart is bigger than the left, then also it fulfills the criteria. And then you should monitor such a patient because in, the, in, those, in this group you have relatively high risk of destabilization in the right. first hours and then you have to go to rescue reperfusion. Mm -hmm. The recent PATO trial showed us that you shouldn't thrombolize those patients right away. Mm -hmm. You can take the strategy of watchful waiting, but you have to monitor those patients. They cannot be just left, you know, alone. So what's new in terms of the treatment of uh, pulmonary embolism? Well, again, for thrombo thrombolytic, there is nothing new. Mm -hmm. For anticoagulants, of course, a lot, because mm -hmm. we have three approved new oral drugs, mm -hmm. which seem to be doing quite nicely. Two of them, apixaban and rivaroxaban, can be used from the very beginning. But you would use higher dosages initially, wouldn't you? Yeah, a slightly higher. For one of these drugs, you need one week to, to have this higher dose, and then you decrease. And for rivaroxaban, you have three weeks to go with a, with a slightly higher dose. The good thing is that you don't have to change the anticoagulant, which is always tricky and always increases the risk of bleeding. You have very rapid onset of action. It has a rapid onset of action, though in all the trials, if you look at them more closely, you see that 99% of patients got at least one shot of, uh, of heparin. I would do that too, because a few hours uh, it takes anyway. But anyway, it should be a good, uh, a good new option for treatment, also extending it to, to home treatment. What about removing the, the clot? I mean, intuitively you would say, I mean, let's get rid of the clot, very much like in acute uh, myocardial infarction in STEMI. Why is this not common practice in pulmonary embolism? If the patient can be stabilized, the clot will anyway uh, disappear within uh, two weeks, four weeks in most of the patients. But there is a group, a uh, small group, about 1% of all survivors of pulmonary uh, embolism, that will, uh, will turn into chronic pulmonary hypertension, which is called CTPH, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And those guidelines are the first to introduce a whole chapter about it, because this is a very interesting thing. And then you have to remove not, much, not that much the clot, because it is already organized, but you have to perform the thrombendarterectomy uh, of pulmonary. Which is a big operation that needs experienced surgeons, right? Yeah. But there is also one new thing, which is optimistic, balloon pulmonary angioplasty for those patients and it has been successfully started now also in Europe. Yes, and I heard that there is less restenosis in this particular vessel, yeah. uh, so the balloon itself seems to be efficacious. Exactly. Very good. Well, thank you very much for sharing uh, the new stuff uh, on pulmonary embolism. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Tom.